Hey everyone, <clears throat> I'm Jonathan Kelly. Um, I'm currently working as a solutions architect with the Rackspace OpenStack private cloud group. Um, but I have the dubious honor of uh, having had pretty extensive monitoring experience um, over multiple roles in my career. Um, at some point in my career, I, I realized I was never going to be able to escape from monitoring. Uh, so I've learned, learned to love and embrace it. Um, and uh, that's what I'm here to talk to you guys about today, is monitoring OpenStack in the enterprise. Um, so show of hands, uh, how many of you travel by car on a regular basis? How many of you have ever experienced an unexpected breakdown? Wouldn't it be great if your car could tell you uh, your alternator just broke and I know everything seems OK, but if you don't get this fixed now, your car's not going to start tomorrow morning. Um, or if it could tell you, hey, judging by the wear level on your wheel bearings, you're going to need to replace those within 1,000 miles. Um, or when your car does break down, if it could tell you what specifically broke and what parts you were going to need to replace to get it running again. Um, that would be pretty great, right? And, and that's what monitoring can do for you. Um, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. <clears throat> so what we're going to cover today, um, we're going to talk about the benefits of a robust monitoring solution. We're going to talk about the differences between alerting and metrics and why both are critical to a well-designed monitoring system. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of correlation and suppression to remove noise in your monitoring system. Uh, we're going to talk about creating effective alerting and walk through an example of how to do that in the context of OpenStack. Um, we're going to talk about service level validation, um, how to prove your environment is functioning within certain parameters. And we're going to talk about forecasting growth so you can grow your environment before you start to run into performance issues. <clears throat> so let's, let's look at two scenarios. Scenario one, you wake up, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, you have 700 emails in your inbox, your phone is blowing up, every second more alerts are coming in. Um, you take a look through them and you try and figure out what's going on, you're still trying to shake off the sleep, it's just hundreds of alerts, looks like everything's broken, some things are going down, coming back up, your main site is down, um, it's really not good. So you, you know there was a scheduled maintenance last night, so you call the, the dev on call, and he tells you, oh, we exited, QA, uh, or we exited the maintenance window two hours ago, QA passed, everything was still working properly. Um, so you're just you know, trying, trying to dig through all your systems and figure out what broke, how to fix it. An hour passes, your boss calls you up and tells you you've blown your SLA for the month. Um, really bad situation to be in. Uh, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands on this one, but I will say this is not an uncommon <laughs> This is not an uncommon scenario in the IT world. I'm sure there are several of you in the audience uh, who've experienced this before, uh, perhaps you know, every night for a month. Um, and it's, it's not a good place to be. And that's, that's an example of how a bad monitoring s system can almost be worse than no monitoring at all. Um, although the worst thing of all is to have a customer call or an end user call and tell you that your system is down because you don't know about it. Um, <clears throat> scenario two, uh, you wake up. You see about a, a dozen messages in your inbox, and, and it basically just looks like your MySQL VIP is flapping. So you log into your monitoring console, and you look and see what related alerts are there. You see that all of your MySQL uh, read slaves are hitting max connections. Um, and so that's, of course, causing them to fail health checks with the load balancer, drop out of the pool, and then after 60 seconds, when all the connections time out, they start passing health checks and get re-added. So it's causing your MySQL VIP to flap. So you log into one of the servers that's currently failing health checks, take a look at the connections that are active, and go back to one of the web servers that that's, has this connection open and take a look at the application, and you see, hey, this application was modified 30 minutes ago. That's an hour and a half after the maintenance window supposedly ended. Um, so you take a look, and you see it's not closing out database connections. That's great. So you call the dev on call, let them know what's happening, disable the application, write up and send out a root cause analysis, and within 20 minutes, you're back in bed. Um, so I, as someone who's personally lived through both of those scenarios, <laughs> I can tell you that the latter is a much better place to be, and that that's what taking the time to invest in building a good monitoring solution will provide for you. Um, and this was something that I learned out of necessity because I wasn't sleeping, and uh, getting woken up every night at 2 in the morning is, is no fun. Um. <clears throat> So I, I, guess, I guess the point of that is uh, that taking the time to develop a good monitoring solution is, is probably one of the best investments you can make in your platform um, for a variety of reasons. Um, so when I first started in my IT career, um, I, was, I worked as a sysadmin, and I really thought of monitoring in terms of something breaks, you get an alert. More things break, 
you get more alerts. Um, and then, you know, there, there's those alerts that come in at 3 in the morning when your cron jobs run, and you know you can ignore those because th those don't matter. Nothing's really actually broken. And you develop kind of a, an apathetic attitude towards, towards monitoring. Um, and, and to some extent, that mindset makes sense when your job is entirely based around incident response and triage. Um, but when you become a platform owner, a lead engineer, or something along those lines, um, where you, you're actually responsible for the uptime of your platform, you realize just how lacking that, that approach is. Um, you realize that you need to know, ideally, before things break. You need to know before you run out of memory. Um, <clears throat> you need to be able to forecast your, your growth requirements to track your utilization. Um, and you, you need to take a more proactive approach to monitoring. When, when you do encounter an incident, you need to create a, a new set of monitoring tools to uh, ensure that if that occurs again in the future, you catch it. Um, even, even if you feel like you've permanently resolved it, because uh, recursion is a real thing in IT. Um, if there are any developers in the audience, um, we, we all know how much time we spend on a, a recursion <laughs> regression. You, we all know how much time we spend on regression testing in the software world, um, but regression is a real thing in infrastructure as well. Um, and just because something's fixed today doesn't mean you're not going to see it again. You know, probably six months or a year from now when you've forgotten exactly uh, what what causes it and how to fix it. Um, so, I, I hope that at least for some people in the audience, that these concepts reflect a, a change in the way you think about monitoring and that there's something that you can take away and, and apply to your job in a way that's going to make your life a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> so what, what specifically can monitoring do for you? Um, so monitoring provides a variety of benefits. Um, it can improve application uptime by reducing the amount of time it takes to resolve incidents, by helping you to, to perform a better quality root cause analysis and permanently resolve a greater percentage of incidents. Um, it can reduce burden on staff by ensuring that every alert that comes in is something that's, that's meaningful and needs to have action taken on it. Um, people don't have to waste time sorting through, is this something I need to, to do anything with? Does this matter? You know? um, and you can improve performance by uh, forecasting growth requirements before you start to run into performance bottlenecks and have outages or performance degradation. <clears throat> So uh, before we dive in, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about monitoring semantics. So <clears throat> there are two main facets to monitoring. Uh, there are performance metrics and alerting. Um, when a lot of people think about monitoring, they think about performance metrics, which are you know, CPU, disk, and memory, um, and others, which we'll talk about in just a sec. Um, so this is something that most people are probably familiar with. The purpose of performance metrics is to let you know um, utilization of, of various aspects of your system. Um, it, in a more abstract sense, it's to measure and report on quantifiable data from your, your system. Um, the purpose of performance metrics um, are to provide you with information that allows you to identify if resource constraints are relevant in, in, during an incident or while performing a root cause analysis, as well as to forecast growth. Um, to contrast that, uh, alerting is oriented around identifying failure states in the environment. Um, so. We'll dive a little bit deeper on that in a sec. Um, but in, in short, um, alerting is taking the events that occur in a system, the discrete changes that occur in a system, and identifying which ones of those actually indicate a failure state and require action to be taken upon them. Um, so performance metrics, uh, also called quality of service or QoS metrics, um, Silometer just calls them metrics. Um, it's basically just a way to, to track and record time series data. Um, so uh, while, while an incident's occurring, while you're performing a root cause analysis, it's useful to be able to determine if it's the result of like a logical system failure, something breaking in an application, or whether it's the result of, of uh, insufficient resources somewhere in the infrastructure. And that's, the, that's where QoS uh, comes in handy, or performance metrics come in handy in an incident response context. Um, and it's, it's really profoundly useful. It can reduce the, the resolution time of incidents dramatically. Um, if you don't know what your system resource utilization looks like across the cluster and on individual machines, you can spend a lot of time trying to identify application failures um, when there's no real application failure. It's just not responding because it has inadequate memory, uh, network resources, what have you. Um, I think we already 
Yeah, oh. So CPU, disk, and memory, uh, everyone's familiar with those. And, and when a lot of people think about monitoring, that's what they think about. There's a lot more that you can do with, with performance metrics than just that. Um, some really useful ones at a platform level are page load time, um, application response time, and then at a system level, disk I.O. Um, for most people who have a content delivery system, page load time is one of the most important metrics that you have. Um, and it's one that not many people think about. Um, I, I don't remember the statistic off the top of my head. And, this is a bit extratemporaneous, so if you'll pardon me, but uh, the, the abandonment rate for website web pages goes up uh, exponentially as the page load time increases beyond one second. Um, and this is something that every major site tracks and uh, attempts to drive down as low as possible. Um, it is something you should be tracking. <clears throat> so what, what do performance metrics look like? This is just a, an example with some mocked up data in case anyone's not, not familiar with this at all. Um, in, in this case, we're going to um, say that we're measuring page load times once per minute. Um, and this is what some data may look like. You can see you have a timestamp, you have a metric name, and you have a measurement. Um, so in this case, our, our main page is taking uh, 0.73 seconds to load. Um, and you can see we had another record and another record. Um, and, and over time, that aggregates into some very useful data um, that you can use. And we'll talk, talk about that in a sec. Um, some other sample data uh, measuring the load average, five minute load average of web servers. Um, a bunch more simulated data where you have a main page, uh, login page, mobile page, three web servers you're, you're monitoring. Um, and you can see if you, if you were doing you know, incident resolution and you saw a, a load average like 382.7 on a server, you know that there's probably something uh, going wrong there. Um, typically, this data is going to be stored in a database somewhere. Um, most monitoring solutions have a way to view it in a summarized form via graph um, over various time periods. So you could look at you know, a, a five-minute graph, a one-hour graph, a one-day graph, a one-week graph. <clears throat> so uh, alerting, as we discussed, is when events meet criteria indicating an action is required, with an event just being something that happens in the environment. So uh, you create a VM in Nova, that's an event. You create a, a network in Neutron, that's an event. Uh, someone logs into Horizon, that's an event. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, in a large environment, there are, are hundreds or thousands of events being generated every second, potentially. Um, so there, there's this you know, vast amount of things occurring in the environment. And the, the true art of monitoring, in my mind, is building a strategy for taking all of those events and turning them into a meaningful alerting strategy. And we'll show you guys how to do that in just a couple minutes. So I also want to point out the, the something happening, the events in the, the environment um, include things like threshold alerts. So if you say at 80% CPU utilization, um, I, you know, that's, that's something that is meaningful and significant to me. Crossing that threshold above 80% would be an event. Um, conversely, crossing it back down under 80% would also be an event. Um, <clears throat> that's something not many people consider. But it's useful in the case of like transient uh, error states and stuff that you may not necessarily want to wake someone up at 2 in the morning for, uh, but you, that you definitely want logged. <clears throat> um, yeah. So some sample alerts. Um, here's, here's an example of what some alerts might look like. Um, these are made up of a timestamp, a severity level, and a message. Um, they, may, they might also have a, a host associated with them um, in some monitoring systems where that's relevant. Um, in this case, we can see our, uh, our flagship website, hatsforcats.com, uh, is, is currently down. The HTTP VIP is failing. Um, one of the web servers is failing health checks. And our DB read VIP uh, response time is exceeding the threshold of two seconds. Um, so talk, talking about alerting leads us to our next topic, um, correlation and suppression. According to Gartner, 80% uh, of the mean time to repair is, is wasted trying to figure out um, to where the issue occurred. Um, and that's the, the purpose of correlation and suppression is to remove noise in your monitoring system and to make alerts meaningful. Um, so if you imagine, if you have 200 web servers um, and an update breaks all of them, you probably don't want to receive 200 alerts. Um, ideally, you want to receive one alert that tells you, you know, all of your servers are down. Um, it would be even better if it could tell you specifically how or why. Um, and maybe, uh, maybe during day-to-day -day operations, maybe they, they don't all go down. Maybe one or two of them go down. If you have 200 web servers and one web server is down, um, is that probably going to have an impact on your customers and users? Probably not, right? So you may not want that to be something that disturbs one of your, your sysadmins. Um, you may decide, hey, we don't really care. Um, 
unless there are three web servers down. Um, and that, that's what you could use correlation for. Um, correlation is basically taking multiple related alerts and either summarizing them into a single alert or, or generating a new alert based upon that data. Um, <clears throat> And we'll cover another example in a sec. Um, so suppression is just preventing notification on alerts. Um, and this is useful for a couple of reasons. Um, one, you know, if an alert, tri uh, alert triggers over and over again, you don't necessarily want to get spammed with it every minute when the check runs. Um, another uh, more meaningful use case is when you have a, a more um, complex application where there's you know, a bunch of services that depend on each other. If a downstream service breaks, you don't necessarily want to be notified of every upstream service that's broken. Um, if you can be certain that that's, that's the only thing that's you know, causing the issue, um, then you basically want to know, hey, this is a database problem. I need to go fix the database. Um, you don't want to see that all your web servers are down, that you know, all your miscellaneous applications are down, your API services are down, because um, then you end up with 20 alerts, and you have to sort through all that to figure out what's causing the issue. And that increases the amount of time it takes for you to resolve the issue, as, as Gartner points out. <clears throat> so a quick example of correlation. Um, would be replication lag on, on MySQL slaves. Um, lag on a single slave is not really unusual. Um, a long-running query, there are a variety of, of circumstances where you're going to see some replication lag on a single server, and it may lag a couple seconds behind the master. Um, but if all of your slaves are lagging behind the master, that usually indicates that there, there is an issue in the environment. Um, so instead of seeing something awful like that, where you're just getting spammed with, uh, with database alerts, um, you could use correlation to turn that into a single meaningful alert. An example of suppression, um, let's say uh, MySQL read VIP is down. Um, you know that all your dynamic content health checks for your web services are going to fail. Um, they can't access the database to generate dynamic content. Um, so rather than seeing a whole bunch of alerts that you're a, uh, you know, your flagship site's uh, top 10 hats page is down, your login page is down, et cetera, um, in addition to the read bit being down, you would want to suppress those and just see where the problem is actually occurring. Um, <clears throat> and this brings us to, to you know, what, what is most important, which is ensuring that you know, our feline friends have access to uh, fine quality headwear. That's what this is all about, after all. <clears throat> and uh, by, by applying these principles, we can, we can do that. And, you know, of course, it's a metaphor for whatever, whatever quality service you're providing to your customers or end users. I don't think hatsforcats.com is registered, by the way, if anyone wants a great business idea. Oh, someone beat me to it. <laughs> uh, so... <clears throat> Uh, before we dive in on actually building an alerting strategy, um, I want to cover one more thing real quick. Um, monitoring perspectives. So there are a variety of different ways that you can approach monitoring. There, there are two perspectives that, in my experience, have been the most useful. Um, one being uh, what I call transactional monitoring, and the other being system-level monitoring. Transactional monitoring is monitoring from the end user's perspective. Um, so you're not looking at running processes on the system. You're not looking at load average or anything like that. You're looking at web requests. You're looking at uh, synthetic transactions, API calls, simulating things from the perspective of your end user. And <clears throat> this approach has the advantage of showing the actual health of your environment from the perspective of your users. Um, if you have a, a 200 web server VIP and a couple web servers are down, there's not going to be noticeable impact to an end user. Um, and you want to know that. You want to know that there's no disruption in the environment. Um, you also want to know what the page load times look like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and th this is the approach that you take to identify. This is how the outside world is, is seeing, you know, my system, um, the outside world potentially being internal customers, of course, or what have you. Um, the service level perspective, um, as, a, <clears throat> as a platform owner, is what you care about more, I think. Um, this is what lets you identify that an incident is actually occurring. Um, so maybe 100 web servers are down. The end users are noticing pages are maybe a little slow. Um, but you know, to the outside world, everything's still operating. But uh, you know, un underneath the covers, everything is, is just going crazy. Um, you want to know that. And in addition to knowing that there's an incident, you want to know what specifically is broken. And you want to have access to all the data that you need to troubleshoot that quickly, get it resolved, identify what the root cause was, and hopefully fix that permanently so the same issue doesn't occur again. 
Um, and that's, that's the purpose of the system level view. <coughs> so with, with that context, um, how do we apply all this to OpenStack, right? <coughs> We're going to take a look at Horizon. Um, and walk through a, a simple design exercise on how we could monitor Horizon. Um, and so we start off by thinking about what, what do we want to check on Horizon? Well, let's keep it simple. Let's say we want to, we want to perform a content check to make sure that, the, that Horizon is loading properly, and we want to perform an authentication check to make sure that people can log into Horizon. So we've created over there uh, two, two alerts. We assigned an alert ID to each of them. Um, I'm going to keep the actual method of health check fairly abstract. Um, but uh, in, in this case, you know, there, there are a lot of good examples already on the OpenStack documentation site on how you can make, make these calls remotely via curl or what have you, um, or you know, whatever monitoring system you're using will probably have some plugins for HTTP health checks. Um, I guess the goal is to keep this as, as monitoring platform agnostic as possible, so it's hopefully useful to everyone here. So let's think about this real quick. Um, we're performing a content check on Horizon. Um, if that fails, if Horizon isn't even loading, um, are we going to be able to authenticate? Do we care about an authentication failure? No. Um, it's, it's, if the platform is not working at all, if, the, if Horizon's not working at all, you're not going to be able to authenticate. So we're going to add a suppression ID there and say, hey, if this Horizon content alert triggers, we want to suppress all alerts that match that Horizon auth ID. Um, so that if, if Horizon is down, you don't see, you know, Horizon is, da you know, Horizon is down and you can't authenticate to it because that's fairly redundant. Um, let's think about dependencies. What, what services um, does Horizon depend on to operate properly? Um, obviously, Apache is what serves out the web content. Um, so we need a way to monitor Apache via a health check. Um, and we, we know that if Apache fails, that um, both our content check and our authentication check are going to fail, which means that we need to suppress if, if that alert occurs, we need to suppress both the Horizon content check and the Horizon authentication errors. Um, <clears throat> and we'll actually walk through some examples of what the suppression would look like and what actual alerts you'd see in the event of various failure states in a sec. Um, other dependencies, Keystone. Um, Horizon's authentication depends on Keystone. And so we need a, a health check for that. You could do that via just a, a curl call to the API or, or using a you know, Python script, whatever, whatever your, your monitoring system allows. Um, and if that, if that health check fails, um, your content checks are not going to fail. Your Apache health checks are not going to fail. But you are going to not be able to authenticate into Horizon, um, which means that we're going to need to suppress that authentication alert from Horizon. So if Keystone's down, can't authenticate into Horizon, don't care that you can't authenticate into Horizon, because th the root cause of the issue is that Keystone is down. And that's the thing that you need to fix first. Um, finally, uh, what does Keystone depend on? Keystone depends on MySQL. That's where it, it gets its user data from. Um, so need to perform a health check on MySQL. Um, and at this point, I'll talk about um, this applies to all of these. When we were talking about the system view versus the transaction view, um, one of the big differences there is with the system view, you're typically monitoring an individual system. With the transaction view, you want to run your monitors against the VIP. Um, so in this example, if you were running uh, HA configuration, where you have multiple instances of Horizon, multiple instances of Apache, multiple instances of Keystone, et cetera. Um, in order for these alerts to be meaningful in terms of showing you the health of the overall platform, uh, you need to be monitoring against the VIP, not against individual nodes. Um, because if you have three Apache servers and one's down, um, if it's been pulled out of the load balancing pool, everything's still functioning properly. Um, and, and you, know, you, you want to know that the overall platform is still working. Um, from this perspective, you don't necessarily care that that's failing. So um, when we're talking about these health checks, if you're running a, in an HA environment, you want to make sure that that's against a VIP rather than an individual node. Um, I'll take questions in a sec. Um, finally, if you want to be super paranoid, um, which I am, I think it's, it's almost impossible to over-monitor um, edge cases. Because those are the ones, while it takes you five minutes to set up an alert for it, um, those are the ones that will take you three hours to troubleshoot if they actually occur in reality. And uh, as someone who spent you know, three hours plus troubleshooting a, a memcached key, uh, cache key corruption issue, um, <laughs> if you can monitor it, you probably should. Um, so in this case, we'll monitor the MySQL database record as well. Um, it would probably be a simple select against the Keystone user database to ensure that the user that you're using for your monitoring platform still exists. 
Um, and so in the event that um, there's a restore to the MySQL database, there's some corruption, something inadvertently gets deleted, and your user's no longer there, this will identify you that that's, that's the problem. Um, if that alert was not there, you could just drop the keystone table, and you know, your uh, keystone health check would fail. Um, but the issue would not actually be at the keystone level. It would be at the MySQL level. Um, and you can see the suppression is a little different for that. So if, the MySQL, if MySQL fails, we want to suppress. Um, oh, yeah, actually, I got ahead of myself there. So if the DB record is not there, we want to suppress uh, the keystone health um, check and the horizon auth health check, because authentications are going to be failing across the board. Um, this brings us to another point, which is that if the MySQL health check fails, that DB health check is going to fail as well, because you can't run a select against a database server that's not operating. Um, and so what we've got from this is, um, well, first you can see just saying, hey, let's monitor Horizon. It's a little more complex than that, um, because if you want a really robust monitoring solution, you don't just want to monitor the thing you're trying to monitor. You want to monitor all the dependencies down the chain so that when something breaks, you know where it's broken, and you get a single alert that tells you what you need to start troubleshooting. Um, to blow that up, just in case that was hard to read, these are the, the suppression rules that we've created. Um, so we've got a set of six alerts and a set of suppressions associated with each of them that makes these meaningful. Um, <clears throat> in the event of a failure state, um, so if MySQL fails, you're going to see a, a critical alert, MySQL read VIP down, um, and we'll suppress the Horizon Auth and Keystone Auth alerts. Um, for Apache, you know, and I just made up these criticalities and messages. Um, that depending on your system, it's, it's, the criticality is going to vary. Um, but <coughs> Apache fails, Horizon content gets suppressed, and you get an error saying that your um, OpenStack admin uh, Apache server is down. Keystone fails, we're going to suppress Horizon auth um, alerts and tell you that the Keystone VIP is down, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so now uh, I'm going to try and quickly cover uh, service level validation and forecasting, and then I'll take questions. Um, so service level validation is, is very simple. Um, the, the catch is you need to spend a little bit of time thinking about what you're going to do and getting buy-in before you do it. Um, so you need to answer, what metric are you validating? Um, page load time, we'll use that as our example. Um, so if you, want to if you want to measure page load time and validate that 95% of page loads are occurring in less than a second, right? Um, you need to think about, first of all, um, how are you going to measure that? Are you doing it from a local monitoring uh, point? Or are you doing, you doing it from a monitoring point that's uh, located at your primary customer site? Um, because the actual metric that you're getting, the results you're getting are going to vary based upon where you measure from and how you measure it. Um, and that should be built into your SLA. Um, and how are you going to record and report upon that metric? What um, time period does it span? Is it from 12.01 at the beginning of the month to 11.59 at the end of the month? That shaves off uh, two minutes, which is actually extremely relevant if you're talking about like a 5.9s or 6.9s SLA. Um, and then are there time periods that should be excluded? Do you have a regular scheduled maintenance window um, that needs to be excluded from those SLA calculations? And that should all be um, set in stone before you start doing any, any technical work on this. Um, so we'll take a quick example, um, validating Keystone auth availability. Um, one, one thing to note, uh, my recommendation when you're doing monitoring um, via APIs, anything that involves a username and password, create a separate user, ideally even a separate tenant for your monitoring system. Um, keep it secure. Use a secure password. Um, follow whatever your password policies are. Um, but you want to make it so that if anyone captures that, they're not getting access to anything critical. Um, a little bit of paranoia goes a long way. Um, in this scenario, we're going to say we're going to perform an authentication every five minutes. Um, we're going to look at a one month. Uh, month-long SLA, and so that should be adequate to give us a decent amount of samples, about 10,000 a month. Um, and uh, since this is a very simple example, we're just going to record a failure as zero and a success as one, and this allows us to very simply report on, on SLA uptime. Um, we're going to report by selecting the results from the appropriate time periods, um, so running from the first day to the last day of the month. We're going to exclude 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. on Tuesdays for a maintenance window, um, and in order to get SLA uptime, with uh, that data system, all you have to do is divide the sum of the results from selecting this data from the database by the count, um, and you get something like this. Um, I, I just this is made up data. You'd actually have more samples than that in a month, but 
Um, so we have 5,668 samples. We have 5,644 good samples and 24 bad samples, which provides us with an uptime of 99.577%. Um, if our SLA target is 99%, then we met success for the month. Um, so you can see from that, SLA validation is really simple. Um, it just takes a little bit of pre-work ahead of time, um, but doing something meaningful with it is, is not challenging. Um, forecasting, um, you can go from extremely simple to extremely, extremely complex. Um, we're going to stay towards the simple side on forecasting. Um, first, we're going to talk about very basic, the most basic system of forecasting, which is suitable for smaller infrastructures um, and systems where you don't have uh, probably a, a very stringent SLA around response time or something like that. Um, so in order to create a forecast, basic forecasting system, you need to define um, what's your threshold of, for growth in terms of specific resources. So uh, if CPU utilization is over 80% in the cluster on average, you need to grow. If memory usage is over 80%, you know, in, on average in the cluster, you need to grow. If, if, uh, if your max CPU is over 95%, you need to grow. Things along those lines. Um, and the, the typical things you're going to measure in an OpenStack environment would be CPU uh, usage, uh, vCPU allocation. Um, so what, what's your actual um, allocation ratio given uh, your current overcommit ratio, hyperthreading, et cetera? Um, disk usage and memory usage. And you want to measure, ideally, the average and the max for each of those. Um, and then based upon that data that you've recorded, you want to calculate the rate of change over time. So you end up with something like this. Let's say that our growth threshold is a CPU average of over 50% in our compute cluster. Um, memory average of over 80%, or max disk usage of over 80%, or uh, vCPU allocation over 85%. Um, and here's some, some fictional data here. Um, so CPU utilization, 34% with a growth rate per week, um, four, growth rate of 4% per week. With that, we can forecast that four weeks out, we're going to need to expand capacity. Um, can look at vCPU, memory, disk, the same. Um, you can see that we've got four weeks till we need to increase CPU and 3.8 till we need to increase memory. Um, that's actually good if you see that, because that means you've done a very good job sizing your compute nodes in terms of uh, the CPU to memory ratio, since they're very close to one another. Um, and then, then in this case, you can see we're 19 weeks out from needing more disk. And since we're probably going to add more nodes to meet the, the CPU and memory requirements, that's probably not a problem. Um, I'd point out that the, the vCPU ratio, um, if you see something like this where you're at 73% vCPU utilization but only 30%, 34% CPU utilization, that might be a time to reconsider your overcommit ratio um, and maybe increase it. Um, if, if your you know, hypervisors are 75% full based upon your vCPU allocation, you, know, you only have a, a few more VMs you can create, but you're only using 34% of your CPU on average. Um, you can probably fit a bit more into that infrastructure than, than you can at your current uh, overcommit ratio. Um, so to get a little more advanced, um, so for advanced forecasting, you're, you're looking more at more like statistical models. Um, and this is extremely simple from that perspective. I'm sure there are folks out here who've done stuff 10 times more complex than this. Um, but in short, you want to define um, what, what's your target measurement and what's your threshold. So we want 95% of our page loads to be under one second. Um, and what's your growth threshold? Do you want to wait until you hit that 95% um, page loads being over one, you know, under one second till, till you've just finally hit that threshold and then you want to grow? Um, or is that like a hard threshold where you never want more than 5% of your page loads to take longer than a second? Um, so that needs to be defined ahead of time. Ideally, you get buy-in from leadership and everything, so it's not a battle to get the hardware ordered and everything once you start getting towards uh, having problems. Um, you want to measure your target metric, page load time. Once again, determining how to measure that is very important. Um, and then you want to calcu calculate the average, the standard deviation, and the rate of change from that. And with that data, um, you can easily forecast the date that you're going to violate that threshold. Um, and you'll end up with something like this, where, you're say, where you can say, hey, based upon where we're at currently and how fast we're growing, we can see that in 13 days, we're going to need to increase our capacity by 10%. And then another 13 days after that, we're going to need to add an additional 10%. Um, and this is what your, your, based on your statistical projections, what the utilization would look like or what your um, metrics are going to look like. <clears throat> Some additional considerations. 
um, cyclical traffic patterns. So when I say that's very simple, this, this is primarily what I mean. Um, your traffic patterns are going to vary intraday. They're going to vary weekly, monthly, seasonally, depending on what, what line of business you're in. Um, and so maybe you don't, maybe 95% of page loads under uh, one second is not adequate for you because during peak times, only 20% are under 1% page load. So maybe that's what you want to measure instead. Maybe you want 95% of page loads between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time um, to be what you're measuring. Um, <clears throat> some additional things to consider uh, in, in a cloud context, dynamic resource provisioning. Um, you probably don't want extremely low utilizations in your environment if you have the ability to dynamically provision resources. Um, you don't want to be running at 30% utilization. You want to deprovision some assets and be running at maybe 50%. Um, so, and it follows the same uh, principles as what we've discussed, but we're talking a shorter time scale. We're talking seconds or minutes rather than necessarily days, weeks, months. Um, and back to alerting, a lot of this is involved uh, involves creating these QoS performance metrics and then creating thresholds on those and saying, OK, well, now 99.9% you know, .9 of our page loads are under one second. That means we can deprovision some assets until we get down more towards 95%. Um, and that dynamic resource provisioning can allow you to save a lot of money over time. Um, and it's you know, a big part of, of cloud computing. Um, finally, uh, if you see a high standard deviation, one of the advantages of this slightly more advanced model is uh, if you see a high standard deviation, that indicates that there are probably a lot of opportunities for improvement in the environment. Um, is, there, is there a resource problem that's causing a certain subset of your requests to take longer to process? Um, is there a geographical distribution problem? Do you need to look at content distribution network or something like that to put your data closer to your customers? You know, are your overseas customers blowing your SLA? Um, and do you need to leverage automated resource management? Do you need to be able to provision additional capacity during peak, peak hours and deprovision during off-peak? Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> um, here, here's what you guys know. Um, monitoring can provide you with a lot of benefits. Um, alerting and performance metrics are different, but they're both important. They're both critical to your environment. Uh, correlation and suppression are, are absolutely critical for making alerts meaningful, um, for ensuring that your alerts indicate a failure state, that, that that failure state is actionable, something that you can respond to, um, and that that alert also indicates uh, the point of failure. Um, <clears throat> that uh, creating a high value alerting system is awesome. Um, it will make your life better, I promise you. Um, that SLA validation is simple. Uh, growth forecasting is slightly less simple. And uh, we also looked at some pictures of cats. So uh, my, my challenge to you is to think about um, the things that we've discussed here and think about how you can apply them to, to take your monitoring to the next level and hopefully make your life a little bit better. Um, thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. Oh, let me get you a mic. What has been your experience in using uh, commercial monitoring tools versus open source monitoring tools? Do you find that you can do this using open source quite easily? Um, I would say no. So my, my feeling is there are a few pretty good commercial monitoring tools. There are a lot of really good open source tools, but very few of them there's a single tool that will do. Uh, the suppression and correlation is the point where most open source tools are weak. However, um, you do have the ability to take several open source tools. There are some open source correlation engines, for example, um, and cobble them together and create an effective monitoring solution. Any other questions? Yeah, actually, so the question was kind of related to that because uh, what we have found is, you know, one tool is good for one, but then not for the other. And, uh, you know, the way I look at monitoring is, you know, you have an agent which, you know, you basically capture data and then you mm -hmm. have an aggregator where, you know, it's taking all this data. And, you know, uh, one thing is, uh, you know, as let's say in OpenStack, for instance, as you add more mm -hmm. computes, uh, you know, how do you automate, you know, installing your monitoring agents on, you know, the new computes or making sure that the agent itself is running so that you get the events and, you know, sometimes things that are not coming as an event, like maybe the node actually has gone down. So, um, yeah. So, um, Andy, do you want to take that one? We actually have one of, one of our, uh, our monitoring folks here who can tell you uh, exactly what we're, we're doing in the real world. Hey, uh, so basically when uh, the agent dies, we have an alert that'll basically fire off. So you have like an agent server, right? You, say, you're not, you don't just have an agent running on, a, on 
your compute host, for example, you obviously fire the, the data somewhere else. And so when the agent stop responding on the server, you want to definitely have an alert for that. That's actually one of the almost key components because uh, the agent itself could be a little bit flaky and die off, and right. that's just as important as the server going down because if my metrics aren't going through, if my alerting isn't happening, then uh, it's... Yeah, it's in, a, it's in a pretty bad place. So yeah, you, you definitely want that kind of thing set up. Um, and yeah, I guess that's, that's pretty much the, the main piece on the, on the agent thing. But no, the, the automation, we just use Ansible? We, yeah, we set up a lot. You do definitely want to include your monitoring and your automation. Um, right. I mean, as far as we're concerned, like when your servers go down, that's a pretty big deal. And you need to know about that just as importantly as when you set it up. Um, so we actually have monitoring set up as part of the automation of when we deploy things. So you'll know pretty much straight away if services aren't working from the deploy. And actually, we've used it in some cases to find out when our deploys have gone wrong, like right from the start, which is pretty useful for the deployment teams as well. And it's the same monitoring we use for like uh, normal day-to-day -day, uh, accessing of the service, et cetera. So. And this monitoring tool, is it your own uh, you know, home grown or is it are you using open source? Um, so what we use uh, for private cloud is we have the Rackspace monitoring as a service um, solution. Um, so it is, is it actually open sourced yet? I don't is it available know. on public? So we, we've used a couple over the years. Um, we, we used CA's CAS for a while. We used uh, NIMSOFT's uh, NMS, formerly Nimbus. Um, and now we're using our, our own monitoring as a service uh, cloud monitoring platform. Um, I'll say, based on, on my experience in IT, um, I, I really like NMS. Um, Nimsoft is not, not paying me for this, but uh, I've used it in several roles in the past. And in terms of having a good balance of built-in functionality, um, it has great built-in suppression. And then you can do correlation via just writing Lua. Um, it's, so it's, it's pretty nice. Uh, it's been my favorite so far. Essentially, we've written some Python scripts that are available uh, open source um, that just do some basic monitoring things that we plug into the MAD system, and then we kind of couple that with some of the, the NIMSOFT stuff to, to kind of cover off the stuff that we haven't actually done. Yep. Next question. Oh, thanks, thanks Andy. So I just want to add that uh, earlier today at 9 o'clock, IBM, HP, and Rackspace actually had a session about monitoring as a service. We do have a product called Manaska that's under the, uh, development. So if you're interested in a monitoring as a service product for OpenStack, take a look at the Manaska. How do you spell that? M-O-N-S, Manaska, M-O-N-A-S-A. M-O-N-A-S-A, yeah, okay. We, we had a session at 9 o'clock earlier today. Excellent. I'll check that out. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>